Sure. Kveik. 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 Maybe I should do a yeast scream as well. <laughs> What's up, beer geeks? It's a little early for beer, so I'm drinking some Modern Times Nitro Cold Brew, the Black House blend, which we have on draft here at Old Devil Moon, which is where we are. Yeah, I'm a little jacked up on caffeine. It feels good. I just got back from Chicago. I was there for the Burnt City Brewing Fike Fest. It was awesome. I wanna give a shout out and a huge thank you to Ben Seller from Burnt City, to Lance Shaner from Omega for getting me out there to Chicago, putting me up for that event. It was, it was super fun. The weather was gorgeous. It was like this outdoor festival. I'll probably put some pictures up. Yeah, such a good time. First time in Chicago. What a beautiful city, I love it. The weather, like I said, was really great. So yeah, I haven't been there in winter. So yeah, I just wanted to give some, some shout outs. Almanac Beer Company. I went, stayed in a room with Phil Emerson, their head brewer, and they rebrewed a collab beer I did with them, a double IPA called Hot As Hell. Got to you know, kind of pour one of my own beers. And then they also had one called Strawberry Hop Cake, which was done with Hornendal. Hot as hell was done with Voss. I wanted to give a shout out to so Master Cicerone Pat Fahey and Master Cicerone Avery Swanson. Two of the 18, kind of ran into them and got to hang out with them. That was, that was really cool. We went out to dinner Saturday night, talk a little, you know, Cicerone shop. John Laffler at uh, Off Color. Super rad dude. Uh, the Mouse Trap, his one of his spots there in Chicago. That was rad. They hooked me up with, I think, the nerdiest beer T-shirt I own, and I own a basically my entire wardrobe is beer shirts. This might be the nerdiest one that I have ever had. Wild does not mean sour. That's just wow. Yeah, some hills you die on. Yeah, I had to think about it for like a second. So yeah, of course that's totally true. Sour as a category for beers is like a very problematic term. I'm not gonna get into that. Not in this video, maybe in a future video. You're here to watch Lars Marius Garschel's talk on Norwegian Farmhouse Brewing in Kvike. I wanna give a huge shout out to him for giving me permission to film his talk. I first met Lars in Hornendal at Norse Cornell Festival, maybe it was like 10 months ago. He gave this talk there, but this is the first time he's done it in North America. It's almost a year later. You're gonna learn so much about Kvike and Norwegian Farmhouse Brewing and their traditions. Man, I just, Lars, the work he's doing, it's so freaking cool. I'm, I'm just so thankful to him for, for doing all this, bringing it all to our attention and being such a great kind of voice for it. He's a rad dude, a great storyteller, a great speaker. So you're in for a treat here and I know that's what you're here for. So I'm gonna shut up. His book is coming out, Brewers Publications, great publisher, it comes out next year, it's like six months from now or something, you can pre-order it. Uh, maybe I'll link it in the description actually. Thank you Lars for permission to record, enjoy the rest of your trip in North America. Uh, hopefully I see you maybe here at Old Devil Moon for a talk once your book comes out and you go on tour. Uh, by the way, hit that subscribe button if you don't mind. You know, give me some love. Thanks beer geeks, cheers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody. Um, sorry about the delay. There were uh, more of you than expected, which is of course great, but uh, we had to improvise a little. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a big day for me. Uh, it's my first talk on beer in North America ever. So I'm. Th thank you for, for coming and for supporting me. Um, this is this is also a big day in in another way that I wanted to, to talk about for a moment before I start. Um, I gave almost this talk in uh, Voss in Western Norway, where some of these yeasts come from. And one of the organizers of that event was a farmhouse brewer himself. So when I when I finished talking, he. Uh, asked the people in the audience who were brewers to, to stand up and 20, 30 old guys stand up and he says, congratulations everybody. So, so the brewers themselves, they see kind of the content of this presentation as 
a vindication of the, of the things that they have been doing and that haven't always been looked on with great respect in the local community, if I can put it that way. So having this level of interest in North America for what they're doing is, of course, even more vindication. So I'm going to to show them. I'm just going to take a photo of you guys. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Hey, hello, everybody. OK, thank you. Um, so doing, doing this talk is a little bit weird because some of the people here know absolutely everything that I ever wrote, and I bet a lot of people here don't know anything. So uh, since it's the first talk ever in North America, I'm just going to start from the beginning. Uh, and if you heard it before, I'm sorry, but there's nothing to do about it now. Um, so to kind of get into this, I, I wanted to go back to, to the beginning and ha how it all began. Um, and for me, that was in uh, 2012, when some friends of mine got hold of one of these plastic bottles containing weird-looking stuff and brought it uh, down to where I live. And when I tasted this beer, uh, the thing that surprised me was that, you know, when, when, you, when you try a beer that has a new ingredient, it sort of it tastes like normal beer, and there's like, okay, you can taste there's some, one special thing in there. This beer was like somebody took the whole concept of beer and turn, turned it into something else, something I'd never tried before. And that, that got me really interested, in part because I, I realized that this farmer from central Norway, he hadn't reinvented the concept of beer all by himself, right? He had to have gotten these ideas somewhere. But where? I mean, I never, I never heard of anywhere that this could have come from. So I started, I started digging into this, and by luck, I got invited to, uh, to a brewing session. And right, the moment you see the brewery, you see that this isn't a normal home brewer. This is not a commercial brewer, right? This is, this is somebody from somewhere else. And uh, the, the, the thing that perhaps struck me most about this brewing session, the beer was, again, completely different from everything else and so on. But the brewer, when, every time I asked him, so why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? He got a little bit embarrassed and then, well, he didn't really know. You know they, they taught him you should brew like this and so he did and the beer was great. But nobody seemed to have ever considered like, why should we do this thing? That wasn't, you didn't need to know that. And he brewed the same beer, literally the same beer for 20 years. Of course he knew what to do. And of course it was good. So this made me even more interested. And I started digging into you know, the, the historical sources that exist. And one of the things that struck me there, this is a Norwegian book on, on traditional farmhouse brewing. This is the chapter on yeast. I read about these, the, this uh, time when everybody had their own yeast. I remember reading this and thinking, wow, that sounds amazing. I, wa I wonder what those beers must have been like. And then you keep digging, and it turns out, hey, Michael Jackson was in Norway. And he visited people, and they had this yeast. And you look at the date, it's like, what the hell, it's 1992. <laughs> right? And you keep digging, and then uh, here's a homebrewer forum, Norwegian Homebrewers Association, basically. And there's this guy, he's read the Michael Jackson article. Uh, and then, oh, he's been in touch with the homebrewer shop in Voss, which is where this came from. Oh, they're going to send him something in the mail. Like, wow, OK, 2008, we're getting close, right? Uh, and so th basically, that's as far as I've got. Uh, this, th this was the information that was available that I was able to find. So clearly, in this area in Norway called Voss, people had some kind of yeast. They called it kveik. Maybe it was really old. Maybe it had always been there. At least that's what they said. Uh, and a lot of homebrewers were skeptical about this, right? Had to be wild yeast. Had to be uh, polluted with all kinds of stuff. They thought, but nobody had really ever been close to it. So we spent about we spent about nine months doing research to prepare for a trip to to try and visit these people. 
Uh, and I really mean nine months. This was finding these people was not easy. So before we go on, I wanted to just say where Vos is. When you look at it on the map, this is like this is far north. This is north of basically all of Europe, right? Um, and not only that, but it's um, not sure if you can see it very well, but this is in Western Norway and it's inland. This is the one community in Western Norway of some size that's not by the sea, which is of course significant, right? These people got cars in the 1960s. So getting to this place before 1960, it wasn't that easy. So this is Sigmund. We visited him in uh, May 2014. Basically, by getting his son's friend to persuade him that this guy, these guys that I never heard of, two Canadian guys and this guy from Oslo, like, they could stay in our house for 24 hours, right? While we brew. That should be okay. And he said yes. He's a very generous guy. Uh, and again, you see, okay, this one, this brewery is whitewashed and, and uh, white painted, but it's pretty much the same setup. And when we uh, visited Sigmund to brew, the first thing he did was take the kettle, fill it with water, stuff it full of juniper branches, and make the, make the brewing liquor. So in Norway, you don't brew with water. You brew with uh, juniper infusion. Juniper branches is deep in hot water. And while Sigmund was doing this, he was fiddling around with the sieve that you see in the photo. And I asked him, so why, why are you doing this? And he, he looks at me and he says, well, you know, you get all sorts of stuff with this juniper, like spiders. You don't want that in the beer. <laughs> and when, this is from when we tried it at home, and yep, totally. Spiders and uh, ladybugs and stuff. And then uh, when he explained to us the, the ingredients that he was going to use, it was juniper branches, pilsner malts, um, sauce hops, the same hops that you use in pilsner, and his own yeast. And it was like, what? Vos beer is like pilsner with a strange yeast and juniper in it? <laughs> and then uh, we persuaded him to, he, he told us he didn't have any beer left, but he had some in the keg that was, you know, it was just a drag, so he didn't want to serve it, and we kind of forced him. <laughs> and then you get this glass, and it's like, you use Pilsner malts? That's like a dark beer. What's going on here? Uh, and then it smells of oranges. What the hell? None of those ingredients should taste of oranges, right? And that's when we, that's the first moment when we thought, this quite yeast, that could be, that could be interesting. Yeah, um, Sigmund uh, mashes in this ton that you see, he filters stuff through juniper branches, gets the wort, then he starts boiling. He starts with 300 liters of wort, and then he boils it down to half of it. Well, this is where the color comes from, right? So when we, when we did this at home with gas, where you don't get as much color, the difference is pretty clear, right? With him, it comes out almost like, uh, like red wine. And the reason you do this is uh, these people were using their own grain. They didn't have any more grain than they needed. And so when, you, when you're doing the lautering, you're running off you know, sugary liquid, you wash out more and more sugar in the malt. At some point, you get to the point where now you're diluting the beer. It's becoming weaker. But there's still sugar left, right? And they figured out that, whoa, we can run more, of course we get too much water, we can just boil it away. So it's actually a, uh, it's an economical device, it's a money-saving device. Um, so the cost of making the beer stronger is firewood, which grows absolutely everywhere. That's not an issue. So, and then while he was, he was boiling this, out on the table comes this jar. Uh, which he's kept in the fridge since the previous brew. And that's, when I saw that, that's kind of when I realized that, oh shit, this is, this is actually serious. He's not making it up. And he opens the glass and he goes, Psh! it's alive, right? He's got, he's got uh, domesticated animals that live in his fridge. Uh, and they, they come from his uncle. So 
And his uncle got it from the, from the brewers on the family farm. And where did it come from before that? Nobody knows. Nobody can tell you. Because um, the people who know are dead, right? It's as simple as that. Um, but this is, of course, not how they did it in the old days, because this requires a fridge. So he also showed us the yeast strain they used to, uh, to dry it, right? I guess most people have seen this by now. You drag it through the slurry, get a lot of yeast on it, you hang it up, and you throw it back in the ward. And one of his neighbors, a few kilometers away, he told me that his, uh, his grandpa didn't use one of these. He used a straw ring. And he would, he would hang it uh, outside the barn, under the, under the eaves, where it was windy and it would dry out. And this guy, he's like 75. He goes real quiet after he says this and kind of disappears for a moment. And he comes back and says, I, I, I can picture him now take, taking it down from the eaves. You know, the, the birds, they shat all over the ring. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, grandpa would just take the knife and scrape off. <laughs> it's like, don't ask me, but apparently this worked. Right? Okay, so you want to use it? You throw it in wart. This is 10 o'clock. Four and a half hours later, it's fermenting, it smells of oranges. But I think it's worth reflecting for a moment on like technological sophistication here, right? Imagine this is straw. This is this is everything you need. This is your lab. And it actually works. Yeah, and then we have the, the temperature thing. You all know that, right? So we're not going to belabor the point. I will say, though, that uh, Sigmund pitches the yeast at 39 uh, degrees centigrade, but these neighbors in the neighboring valley, they used to pitch at 43, which is the, the max amount that that yeast can handle, according to lab tests. But they've actually heard about modern brewers tell them this is too hot, so they reduced it to 37. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is Sigmund with the, uh, with the wort once it's finished. You see it's, it's almost the color of uh, a red wine. So from, um, after we brewed with Sigmund, we stayed in the area a couple of days. We drove north. This is Stranda. This is by the, by the fjord. Here we met uh, a bunch of old farmhouse brewers who basically started reading modern brewing literature. So they uh, changed their brewing habits. They stopped using the yeast, which was a bit disappointing for us. Um, when I met like our contact here, he, uh, we showed up too early. So he drove us around the village showing us stuff. And I noticed he had like this box of sour cream in the side uh, door pocket of his car. It's like, who drives around with sour cream in their car? It's like, what? And, and we're asking him all these questions. You know, he's telling us, okay, so here's this famous thing. And we're asking him, so do you boil the wort here? Do you have break? He's trying to show us the village, and we're trying to extract brewing information. And he's not very forthcoming. And then suddenly he says, take that sour cream box, open it. And the contents look like this. Taste it. Oh, it's yeast. So he was giving me the, the uh, yeast that he hadn't used in, I don't know, 10, 15 years, basically to get rid of it. Uh, I, sent it to the, I sent it to the lab, uh, and they sent me an email back like a few weeks later. Sorry, Lars, we can't, we can't get this to grow. It's dead. Uh, and then a few days went by, and I got a new email. Oh, actually, there was some dried up material in a corner, and I scraped it loose, and I tried again, and now it grew. Uh, so this is... Uh, this is the Stranna yeast, the one that sold us hot head. That's where we got it from, and that's how close it was to disappearing, basically. Yeah, and I don't know, I thought these things were round, I don't know where, where, the, where the corners are, but whatever. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> yeah. Um, later, uh, I got in touch with this other brewer in uh, Hornindal. That's like the other place name that everybody's heard, right? It so happens that uh, the second community of some decent-ish size that's not by the sea is Hornindal. 
Uh, but this looks like a, a fjord, but it's not. It's a lake. It's the deepest lake in uh, Northern Europe. It's actually 500 meters deep, 1,500 feet. Um, here's Tarier of the Vol. Again, it's the same story, right? He learned to brew in the summer holidays with his uncle, who is 17 years old. His uncle learned to brew when he's 14. That's 1944. Learned to brew from his grandma. So this is the family tradition, right? And he makes raw ale, like you can find a few examples of uh, out there, like the collab that we did with, and I, I did with uh, Burnt City, which I recommend. It's one of the two beers that I tried today. But it, it has this raw ale flavor, so I, I recommend that. Um, he also has the quack, and he, um, it's actually his father-in-law that is the, the keeper of the quack. So he cleans the yeast, washes this in uh, water, uh, they dry it, and then they put the dried flakes in the freezer. So he dropped by his father-in-law that morning, picked up this box, and then it just sits there in the brew house and it, it thaws by itself, basically. So what he's doing here is he's taking the, the first runnings of the wort, and now he's just dropping the dried flakes straight in. Uh, you can't see it because I positioned this badly, but the time is uh, 14.30, so 2.30 2 p.m. 31 minutes later, it's fermenting. <laughs> I couldn't believe that when I saw it, but to them, it's like, oh yeah, it's, the yeast is okay. We can, we can, we can go ahead. Uh, 30 degrees. So in this region, they don't go so hot. Why don't they? There's no knowing. Um, and when he was doing this, he, he looked at me and he says, so now we're making Māori aue. And that's a really weird word, because I, I can understand that in the dialect he's saying uh, Māori's eyes. Māori is a common Norwegian woman's name. But like, so the, the, the eyes is kind of easy, right? You see the bubbles? Okay. But Māori? That didn't make any sense. Um, so I found, I found this word in a Norwegian dialect dictionary, and it says, uh, it's not actually Māori. It's uh, Maria, the Virgin Mary, that it's named for. It's the Virgin Mary's eyes. Now, Norway turned Protestant in 1537. This is not a new word, right? <laughs> this is not a new word at all. Apparently, they use it only in this little region. I haven't, I haven't heard of it from, from anywhere else. Yeah, then he takes the, the bucket, drops it in the wart, 48 hours later, party. This is the local tradition of uh, Upskoke, where basically people would see that you were brewing, and since everybody fermented the same amount of time, they knew when the party would be, and they just showed up. <laughs> and the party always happens in the brew house, because uh, the occasion is the brewer is sitting there, he's got finished beer that he has to transfer to the whatever he's going to keep it in, He's going to have to do some cleaning. This is going to take a few hours. Of course, he's going to taste the beer. And everybody knows, that, okay, if we drop by just now, right? So in, in, um, in Estonia, they don't have this custom, but one of the guys I interviewed, he told me that for 40 years, four decades, every single time that his grandpa finished the beer and was racking it, the neighbor would come. So this ladder do you have, this longer than mine. Oh, you go finish beer, do you? And of course, there would be a party and, yep. So at this point, um, just checking what the time is. Yep. Uh, I sort of, I knew that quake was something special. Uh, I can, there was the temperatures, of course, there was the flavors, it was the speed, but it was not at all clear what the stuff was, right? Okay, we have yellowish brown sludge that ferments beer. Um, and it was not at all clear if they really kept this going, right? The bird shit on the ring and all that stuff. Um, I, tr I tried probing the origins, right? And every, every time you do that, it's the same story. So I told you about Sigmund, got it from his uncle, got it from the farm. Uh, Tairie got it from his friend. His friend got it from the family farm, from people who are now dead. Every time you do this, it's the same thing. You can follow the chain back and you get to somebody who's dead. 
which means it could be really old or it could be shop piece from 30 years ago, right? You don't know. Um, but I thought I would, um, okay, I said earlier we were gonna go back to the beginning. Now we're gonna go back to the beginning. Um, this all seemed, when, when this started, this whole idea of yeast coming out of a background like this seems really odd to people. Uh, but it's basically, it's because we've forgotten how people used to live, as much in the US as, as in Norway. So, 150 years ago, it didn't really matter that much where you lived because uh, you were gonna be a farmer and you were gonna go gra and grain. And the reason is very simple. You can make stuff on your farm that you can sell, but you cannot transport it to where people will buy it, right? And even if you could, getting food from there and back to your farm enough to feed your family for a year, that's not gonna happen. So what people did is they grew grain and they ate it. That's how they made a living. Like 70 to 90% of the, the calories that people consume, it came from the grain. And so this meant that in Norway, especially, Every piece of land that you could grow grain on, they grew grain on. It could be like this, didn't matter. So in fact, in Norway, you know, you have this image of people plowing the fields and so on. In Western Norway, they didn't do that. They shoveled them by hand. Um, so in the autumn, right, you got the grain, you harvest it. So what are you missing now before you have beer? You are missing malt, but you have the grain. So basically what you're missing is work, right? You put in 10 days of effort, you got the malt. You put in another two days of effort, you got the beer. You don't need to pay anyone anything. You have absolutely everything you need. The juniper is just growing there. The grain you got, the yeast comes from grandpa. The hops grow by the, by the wall of the house, you're done, right? So uh, this is something that people have difficulty grasping, but the, the literal fact is that every household in the countryside in Northern Europe brewed their own beer. Every single one. In fact, at one point in Norway, uh, you, were, you were required by law to brew twice a year. If you didn't do it three years in a row, you were exiled. I'm not joking. This is literally the law. It was the law from nine, 960 until 1275. And... and uh, this law was totally uncontroversial because this was something people were doing any anyway. It turns out the reason they had this law was about introducing Christianity. It had nothing to do with beer. But whatever, whatever. Um, and this went on for a long, long time. Uh, this is the burial mound in Denmark. It's from 1500 uh, before Christ. When they dug it out, the, the farmer removed this mound because uh, he, it was in the middle of his field and he was fed up with it. And in it, they found um, a coffin, oak coffin, literally three and a half thousand years old. Inside it is the, the body of a young woman and a, uh, a bucket actually made of birch bark. I didn't know you could even do that, but they did. And there was dried up remains of beer inside, right? So they didn't start brewing in 1500 BC, right? They had, by that point, already brewed beer so long it was part of their burial customs, right? So the beginning is much further back. How far? We don't know. So if we look at the history of beer, like from a really a bird's eye view, in the beginning, 1500 BC, there's only farmhouse ale. There aren't any commercial breweries, not in Northern Europe anyway, right? Who, who, who would you sell beer to when everybody is a farmer and is making their own beer and they don't have any money, right? It's not gonna work. Um, what does happen is that around 1200 CE, you start getting cities in Northern, Northern Europe. And once you have a city, you have a lot of people in the same place that don't grow any grain. You have a market. And of course, the whole area around the city is filled with people who know how to brew. They make use of this opportunity, of course. And then the Germans come up with the idea that, hey, we can boil the wort with hops in it, and the beer will last. You can export it to the next city. And suddenly, within like 100, 200 years, people have brewing kettles that are 5,000 liters. They're not farmhouse brewers anymore, right? And this, of course, this is where it branches off. 
So you get industrial brewing with the, uh, with the porter brewers in London in the 18th century, like really big scale brewing. This develops into industrial brewing with, you know, purified yeast and commercial malts and all that stuff. And people probably don't like to hear this, but the brewery like this one, they're coming out of the same tradition, right? And all of the people who homebrew, also coming out of basically the same tradition, the same way of thinking. Uh, whereas on the lower end here, these farmhouse brewers, all of this stuff that happens, like the development of thermometers, they don't really pick up on that. Uh, the, the big innovations in farmhouse brewing over the last few centuries is uh, the int introduction of the metal kettle, like four centuries ago, and garden hoses. <laughs> I, I know it sounds funny, but you're making 150 liters of beer, right? This is, this is like 250 liters of water at least. That's 250 kilos you have to carry until you get the garden hose. It's an amazing step forward, actually. But for the most part, for the farmhouse brewers, all the stuff that was going on in modern brewing was they never heard of it. And of course, this, this is why the, the beer from this guy was so different, right? He was just working in a completely different world. So those white dots, those are places where I have a description of how were people brewing in one village and where this description says that they had their own yeast, right? So having your own yeast was about as unusual as having shoes, right? Unless you're in a city. So the places where there are no dots, those are in three categories. Uh, one, there's no people living there because it's too high up to grow grain. Two is too far north to grow grain, or three, I just don't have the document. But they still had their own yeast. So, uh, if, to go back to this for a moment, what happened in the, with yeast handling in this uh, industrial part was, you all know this, right? Louis Pasteur revolutionized yeast in brewing, except he didn't. Uh, what he did was he showed People literally believe that the fermentation was a chemical process, that there were no living organisms uh, involved. And what Pasteur did was he showed that this was wrong. Uh, and he came up with some, some methods to get bacteria out of your yeast in case you made sour beer and stuff like that. And that's basically what he did, except he inspired um, the breweries to take up uh, the methods of what was then uh, modern microbiology. It was actually Carnsberg that uh, revolutionized brewing. Their yeast went bad, and this Danish scientist, Emil Christian Hansen, came up with a method for taking the yeast and diluting it down to a single cell. So you know that you've got a bottle and it contains just a single cell, and then you grow everything up from that under sterile conditions to, to get control over your yeast. And he was able to show that if I take yeast from this bottle, now the beer goes bad again. If I take from this bottle, we get the beer that we used to have. So this is our good yeast, and this is the one that's causing the problem. And then this apparatus that you see on the right-hand side is something he invented uh, so that you could grow the yeast and be sure that it was good once it came out to the, uh, the other end. So this, uh, basically, in the summer of 1883, nobody had ever made a beer with purified yeast. By the mid-1890s, all the lager breweries of any size were using this method. For technological spread in the late 19th century, that's just amazing. But it shows uh, how much need there was, right? So, basically, everyone that was brewing beer before Hansen took the yeast from one batch. Oh, PowerPoint screwed up my uh, nice animation. Okay. Put it in the next batch. You just keep going like this, comes Hansen. You take out a bunch of yeast, you grow it, you reuse it a few times, and you stop. Yeah, it doesn't show properly here. It should show that you start over from the stuff that you stored. So you, you go back to what, what you kept, you throw away the yeast that you were using. But now, thanks to PowerPoint, you can't see that. So the reason this is good is, let's say, uh, something bad comes into your yeast, you start reusing it, before this infection has time to grow to the point where you can taste it, you're gonna throw away the yeast and start over, right? This is why this was so useful. And so 
The Quake brewers basically never noticed this change, right? They just kept going the way things used to be. And then, of course, the question is, so what happened with all the, what happened with the birds that shat on the ring, right? Um, so I said that all the major lager breweries started using Hansen's method by, by the 1890s, right? But what about the ale breweries? Well, it turns out that's a different story. So Labat in, in Canada, you know them. They were using unpurified yeast in the 1980s. Still just repitching the same yeast that they always had. Um, I was told by a Belgian scientist that in, in Belgium it was the same with most of the ale breweries into the 1890s, uh, 1980s again. And I don't know if you've heard of Harvey's. It's a fairly traditional English bitter brewery. Um, this is where they keep their yeast between brews. I stole this photo from uh, Ron Pattinson. They still haven't purified the yeast. And their, their bitter is actually famous. It's absolutely amazing. It doesn't taste like other bitters, though, because there's more than just normal beer yeast in there. But it works. So everyone had their own yeast, right? And then 1935, I guess it died out in, uh, in uh, Western England. Orkneys in the 1940s. Southern Norway, 1950s, it died out. Finland probably died out in the 1960s. Stjørdal, 1970s. Gotland, last time anybody heard of the local yeast there was mid-1970s. Saarema in, uh, in Estonia, 1990s. Denmark, probably 1980s. Psht, the yeast just disappears. And uh, what did we lose? We don't know. It's gone, right? Nobody knows what this was. I can, uh, I'll tell you a little bit that we know about how it worked when, later on, but the flavors, all documents, uh, when they, they don't talk about flavor of beer at all, like they can mention the word sour and that's as far as you get, or maybe strong weak, that's all. So this is, uh, this is where we know that there is farmhouse yeast alive today. Uh, this dot in northern Norway is somebody who got it from western Norway, so that one doesn't quite count. There's probably, or there's, there's certainly more places than these, but where they are, we don't know. There's more places showing up every year. I think it's the last time I got a new yeast in the mail from Lithuania was a month ago. There's gonna be more showing up. So I wanted to know what this, uh, what this quake yeast was. I sent it to, uh, to a lab, actually the, the English uh, National Collection of Yeast Cultures. I got it back. The first thing that was interesting was there was no bacteria, they said, which sounds unbelievable, right? Um, this beer that we brewed with Sigmund in May 2014, he kept one bottle that he served me in the autumn of 2018. 18, so it's four and a half years later. No acid, none, absolutely none at all. Uh, the beer was oxidized, of course, but it was still okay. So there's, there's absolutely no reason to, to not believe this. Um, and in fact, the, the, the guys at MCYC, they were not surprised, surprised at all. They said, no, nah, no, nah, the yeast protects itself. When they get yeast from, from breweries that are repitching, sometimes you see bacteria and then you get a sample of the, of the yeast later and they're gone. They got outcompeted, basically. Um, one thing that's interesting with this slide is that uh, the top one shows Sigmund's yeast, the, the genes in it. Uh, the bottom photo there shows uh, genes from a quake a few kilometers away. And you can see that they're not the same, and you can also see that they are related, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then I tried to push uh, the lab, like, Okay, so it's, ye so it's yeast, but what kind of yeast is it? And I get this, well, we haven't really, we don't really know, but it has moderately well-developed pseudomycelia. Yeah, that's great. That told me absolutely nothing. Um, what I got out, basically, of this email was that I don't really know enough microbiology to know what I should be asking this guy. Uh, and I bet maybe not all of you do either, so... 
a little crash course just to um, get going. So some people confuse yeast with bacteria. That's like you sitting here. You are more closely related to yeast than you are to bacteria. Oak trees also are more closely related to yeast than to bacteria. So all life has, it has a division of three, right? There's some weird guys on the right, forget them. There's bacteria and there's all the people who have uh, a kernel in the cell, right? If you have a kernel in the cell, you're not a bacteria, you're one of us. And yeast is one of us. So yeast is fungi, right? And this thing that we found uh, in the quake, it could have been basically any species within the sugar-eating fungi, right? So this is uh, the lower level there. That's not species. That's families of species. And I left out most of the families, right? So this is, once we start filling in down here, we're at something like, I don't know, two, 3,000 different species that it could have been, right? But the one it was is this one, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the same one that's used in wine, the same one that's used in bread, that's used in, yeah, sake, that's used in uh, top fermenting beer. The other yeast that's used in, in uh, beer is a hybrid of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and a wild uh, species of yeast. So, I guess most people know this, right? This is, this is top fermented beer. But if you go in the store, right, and you buy yeast to put in your bread, that's the same species you're buying. And for most of the bread yeasts that you can find, if you try using it in brewing, it works perfectly well. It makes really good beer. It will probably ferment hotter than your usual yeast, and it will probably ferment faster. And odds are pretty good, it will also tolerate more alcohol. Which is quite interesting. There's a reason for that, but we don't have time for that. Lager yeast is all the, all the lager styles of beer. Yeah, I'm going to skip this. It's, it's too detailed. Okay. The, the, so we, we, we were told from the lab, this is the same type of yeast that's used in, in top fermenting beer. Okay, not a surprise. Trouble is, this could be bread yeast. It could be wild yeast that lives in nature. It could be sake yeast, wine yeast. So we, uh, we don't really know what it is. And, and the other question is, how, where do all these types of yeast come from? Right? In the first place. And the answer is they all come from nature. Right? Saccharomyces cerevisiae is not something that humans invented. It lives in nature, in fact, quite a lot in trees where it ferments the, the sap because the sap contains sugar. So uh, life for trees is part of it is a fight with the yeast over who's going to get this sugar. And at some point, right, people started making beer. And in the beginning, you just make the sugary liquid, and because yeast is everywhere, it's going to find the sugar and it's going to go to work. And it's going to ferment your work. And then eventually people figured out that, hey, if I don't clean this thing that I fermented in when I have a good beer, the next beer is also good. They don't know why, right? And there, there are people in South America that make uh, corn beer to still brew in this way. So Martin Thibault visited the chicha brewers in Peru and kept asking them, so what do you use to, to, to start fermentation? And they all looked blank. One woman said, oh yeah, yeah. And she goes off and she comes back with a block of sugar. They didn't actually understand his question, right? So they're, they're still fermenting in this way. Oh, the quake is working, I hear. Um, <laughs> so, the third step is when you figure out that, oh, it's not actually about the fermenter. It's the gray sludge inside, right? If I just keep that, that's what I need. That's the thing that makes good beer. And if, let's, let's, let me say this thing about technology again. This is a Norwegian uh, yeast log. This is a, thing, a device that Norwegian farmers used to keep the yeast. You don't need something as complicated as that, right? A ring of straw is enough. So given how deeply people cared about their beer and given how extremely little technology you need to actually get control over your yeast, of course, people did this thousands of years ago. 
Um, here are some quotes from uh, Egy Egyptian sources, roughly the year zero, where they're talking about the profession of yeast maker. Right? There are people who, who lease land and they, they pay for it in pitchers of yeast. And some people are hanging up yeast, probably to dry it, right? So in fact, uh, it's not possible to document a period in time where we know that people weren't reusing yeast. There, in, in, that time must have existed, but nobody can tell you when it was, except it was very long ago. And of course, what happens when you take a wild creature and you bring it into your home, it changes, right? Uh, and this happened, with the, this happened with beer yeast as well. So what happens is you have this wild yeast, it lives in your wart, and then one of the cells, right? There's a mutation, one of them starts behaving differently. It will grow exponentially because it grows faster than the others and it's gonna take over. Right? So if, he, if, let's say, this cell grows twice as fast, within you know, 10 batches of beer, that's a million times more. Right? It's really going really to make a difference. So uh, things like being able to eat the sugars that are in wort, uh, tolerating the alcohol, and clumping out of the beer so you get collected into the next batch of beer, these are properties that, that the yeast developed by itself when humans were reusing it. Um, and then, of course, you know, you, you know these stories about uh, caves uh, containing uh, lakes with fish, where the fish have eyes that don't work? What happens is the, ge the genes to make the eyes get broken by mutations, right? Normally, evolution would kill these fish because they're blind, but here, these fish are just as good as other fish, right? And the same thing happens with yeast. So, uh, wild yeast can be dried, but brewer's yeast usually can't because the brewer's yeast is never dried, right? You saw the buckets at, at Harvey's, right? The yeast wasn't dry and they're brewing all the time, so it's just it's going back in and eventually the, the genes that it needs, they just decay, they disappear. So if you made a table of properties, you can, you can clearly see the difference that wild yeast is going to behave different from brewer's yeast. And of course, this gives us something that we can use to determine uh, is quake a wild yeast or is it not? And then there's the issue of phenols. That's like the, the main property the biologists look at. So wild yeast make an aroma that we call phenolic, not because these yeast care about the phenols. Uh, what's actually going on is uh, it's this fight with the trees, right? The trees make some acids to kill the yeast so they can keep the sugar in the sap. And uh, the wild yeasts have figured out that they can take these acids and break them down to phenols, right? But you don't need these genes in the brewery and humans don't like this aroma very much. So typically, all wild yeast will, will make this phenolic aroma and most, not all, but most uh, brewer's yeast will not. So that's another marker that you can use. Uh, and then it turns out that when I was asking uh, the lab, like, what kind of yeast is this? I figured that they would have some family tree for yeast and they could just show me that, oh, it belongs here. It turns out in, in 2014, that tree didn't exist. I wasn't aware of that at all. Uh, it's only uh, with the paper whose title you can't see because it's outside the bottom of the screen, uh, where they published uh, this tree in, for Brewer's yeast in 2016, that we actually got a map. Uh, and what this map showed was quite, it was actually very surprising. So now we're talking only about the, the species Saccharomyces cerevisiae, bread yeast, wine yeast, all of this stuff. Um, it grouped into, into a few clear groups, and you see these group, uh, groups that are called beer one and beer two. Those all come from a single strain of yeast that was spread out uh, very widely geographically. So it started with somebody having, one person having this yeast, and then basically almost all the beer yeast that we have now comes from one of those two. There are some also in this group that's called mixed, which is quite surprising. It turns out that this must mean that when somebody got hold of a really good yeast, it's something that they took good care of, 
and, and something that was kept going for a long time. And one of the ways that we see that is that this beer one group has a geographical substructure. So there's a Belgian-German group, and you can see it splits off, and it splits into a British and an American group. So I thought that when uh, White Labs were selling ale yeast and they labeled it American ale yeast, I figured, yeah, yeah, I spent in the US for 30 years, and now, <laughs> now it's American. No, that's not the case. Uh, there really is American beer yeast that has evolved in the US over a very long time, uh, which is also something this, this paper showed for the first time. So, in fact, it must have crossed the Atlantic like centuries ago, since it's so clearly distinguished from the British group. Yeah, okay, so I, I talked about the, the four ways that people were using yeast, right? So, when did these transitions happen? Well, this beginning of reusing yeast probably happened in the Stone Age. Two, three thousand years ago, right? And the, the last step happened in 1883. And that, this gives you a handle on the magnitude of Hansen's achievement, right? There's no progress. There's no technological progress in yeast handling until 1883. And once you start using Hansen's method, you take, you take out your yeast and you freeze it. You take off a little bit, you grow it. Your yeast doesn't change anymore, right? That's part of the point of using this method, that now you know exactly what the yeast is and it never changes. But that means domestication happened before 1883, right? When the yeast that you normally use to brew was domesticated, people were using the same methods as the guys in Boss, with the bird shit and everything, right? There is, in fact, no essential difference between kike and the other brewer's yeast, except they were used in different ways, right? That's the only difference. So, okay, let's, let's look at the yeast. Uh, these are the places that we have collected kike from. This is all Western Norway, and it's two groups for, quite far away from each other, north and south. Um, it's a family of yeasts, right? It's not one yeast. The different ones behave differently. They produce different flavors. They're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Sometimes you find a little bit of other yeast in there. Usually not. This is the first time I've had my uh, quake talk disturbed by a yeast, by the way. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay. If we look at the properties, right? We take uh, ale yeast and wild yeast, make the same table with the different properties. Turns out, quake yeast is like brewer's yeast. Has the same behavior, except for the drying and the heat tolerance. It's very clearly a domesticated yeast. And people who've brewed with it now, of course, expect this because of how it tastes. So why does it have this insane temperature tolerance? Well. Um, this graph shows fermentation temperatures in farmhouse brewing that I collected from, basically from accounts from all of Northern Europe, right? Uh, Russia, Estonia, Lithuania, Sweden, Denmark, Norway. The normal fermentation temperature was basically blood temperature, or the, what they usually called it was uh, milk warm, the temperature of milk when it comes out of the cow, which is... 35, 36, 37, roughly body temperature. And the reason they use that temperature is that uh, you have 150 liters of wort, right? You just boiled it, or maybe you didn't, but it's still very warm. You have it in a, in a wooden vessel that's really well insulated. You want to go to bed. You want to pitch your yeast and you want to go to bed. Also, you've, you've learned that the longer you wait, the bigger the chances that something you don't want is going to get in here and get to work before you get to pitch the yeast. This is not a sanitized brewery, right, that you're working in. And the temperature drops like this. It starts dropping quite sharply, and then it drops more and more slowly as you get close to the ambient temperature, right? So the last 20 degrees is going to take a long time. So basically, people were really, really eager to get started, and somehow, either they found yeast that could handle it, or the yeast was forced into being able to handle it. 
So, and it's striking that the, the Saison yeasts that also come from a farmhouse back, um, background, they also prefer hot temperatures, right? Yeah, this I just said. And the drying, so why can quake be dried if brewer's yeast cannot? Well, um, this is where uh, the white spots is where people dried their yeast, the black spots is where they didn't. You see, Norway is all white almost. Everyone in Norway dried their yeast. So you, you weren't going to have Norwegian yeast that couldn't handle brew, uh, drying. And if we look at why they dried it, this is uh, showing the number of brews per year. You see, Norway is dark. Denmark is, is bright. The Danes had beer as their daily drink. And in, in, in a Danish farmhouse, if you went into the, you know, you opened the door and you went in, there would be a mug on the kitchen table every day full of beer. The moment somebody had drunk all the beer, they would go in the cellar and they would get more. They didn't drink milk, they didn't drink coffee, they drank beer. And they brewed like every other week, every three weeks. In Norway, they brewed twice a year. And the reason is very simple. Denmark is in the south and has good soil. Norway is in the north, has shitty climate, and the fields look like this, right? There's not enough grain. You don't have enough grain to drink beer every day. And if you only brew twice a year, and you want to keep the yeast healthy for six months, probably even longer, then you have to dry it. Yeah, I'm going to... This is another thing that you see. Um, the, the, the quakes that we collected, when you look at how they behave during fermentation, the ones that are collected from the top, they form like a porridge on top. And the ones that are collected from the bottom, they tend to drop out of the beer within minutes. Because these yeasts know, know in, in quotes, of course, where they need to be to survive into the next batch. And uh, there's a family that um, they're not consistent about whether they take it from the top or the, or the bottom. And their yeast will collect nicely on the bottom, and then if you stick a spoon into it, it, it doesn't quite know if it should be at the top or the bottom, basically. Um, and also, why does quake ferment so quickly? Well, here's a similar graph for uh, how long people ferment it. Most people fermented max two days before they collected the yeast. So another reason, of course, why the yeast has to ferment quickly. Uh, and why did they do that? Well, the yeast grows faster than the bacteria. And the yeast also grows faster than the bad stuff that can get in here. The, the sooner you harvest your yeast, the less of the bad stuff you're going to get. So there's, again, there's tremendous pressure both on the yeast to grow fast and also on you to, to be there early and collect it, to get clean stuff. So basically, um, domestication works, right? The, the yeast behaves the way that it's trained to behave. So this is what I said about we can, uh, we can say some things about the yeast that's dead and, and how it works. If, if you collect the yeast in Denmark and you say to me, this is a farmhouse yeast, now it has to ferment fast, has to ferment hot, Otherwise, I'm not going to believe that this is a farmhouse yeast, because I know how they used it, right? And that goes for all these other places as well. It could be phenolic, though. There's, I, I don't know that. Yeah, and then there, the, there's the, um, the big quake paper that was published, maybe it's two years ago now, one year, where uh, the researchers took this uh, family tree for yeast, downloaded basically all the genome sequences from the other paper and then inserted quake into that. And we discovered that quake belongs to the beer one family, which was a total shocker. It's the same family as most brewers yeast. This is why you can make porter with quake. It's actually relate, directly related to, to uh, English ale yeast. But uh, you see it splits off before all of these others. So it, uh, it must have left the other yeasts quite long ago. Uh, and it turns out there is another twist to the story. Um, yeah, I'm not going to explain that. But basically, when you look at the genes of, of Quake, it looks like they come from two different kinds of yeast. There's a signature you can see in the genome that, that tells you that. So basically, the, they took uh, an algorithm, split the genome into what looked like they were the two different parts, 
And then they put them into the tree separately. And then what you learn is there's one ancestor for Quake that we don't know what is. Maybe they think probably it's a wild yeast, but we don't know. But it seems like two yeasts got together and had a baby, and the baby was Quake, basically. Um, this, which of course you can't see, is the full family tree with beer one is at the bottom. So one Quake ancestor belongs here, and the other one belongs there. And this stuff on the upper right, that's no, man, that's no man's land. We, what else is there? We don't know. There's nothing that it's kind of close to. It's just out, out in nowhere. If we zoom in a little bit, um, there's three beer one yeasts that are closer to the quakes than to anything else. Those three are all Hefeweizen yeast. <laughs> it's like, what? But it doesn't mean what you think. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, the, Microbiologists tell me that the reason this happens is probably the Hefeweizen yeast is also a hybrid. So it's kind of a, the algorithm makes, puts them together because it sees similarities, but they're not historical similarities. Uh, the paper that did this, uh, this first family tree, they, they did some estimates of when they thought the beer one and beer two families started. Uh, Unfortunately, this formula that they used, if you try using that for, some, for other combinations than the ones that they chose, you get numbers that are, make no sense. So they, according to those, um, if, you, if you use the same method, sock yeast diverged from beer yeast in 1200. Do you believe that? I don't. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. So we could have run the same numbers for Quake, we didn't, because we whatever the number comes out, I, I don't believe it. But uh, it's definitely centuries ago that Quake left the other yeasts. Could be four centuries, could be eight, could be 12. We don't, we don't know that. Um, and one point I just wanted to make was that, remember I talked about lager yeast being a hybrid? Yeah, Quake is too. <laughs> Except the difference is uh, lager yeast is a hybrid of two different species. Uh, Quake is a hybrid kind of within the species. Um, yeah, Quake, the word, that's also quite interesting. Um, if you look it up in the same dialect dictionary where I found the uh, Virgin Mary's eyes, um, there is Quake in there, but it means two things. One is yeast. The other meaning is uh, the, the act of brewing, uh, breathing new life into something. So if you, you can quake a fire, for example, you're starting the fire. Uh, if you search uh, Nas Norwegian National Library for this word, a lot of what comes up is people breathing new life into the abstinence work, also drinking abstinence, which is an <laughs> interesting combination. Uh, so uh, it actually comes from the same root as the English word quick, you know, uh, the quick and the dead. Quick originally meant something like being alive. And, and this also means putting life into something. Um, there is actually Old Norse sources that use the word quake uh, in the meaning of yeast. So there's a, um, there's a book of Icelandic stories. It's miracles that were collected for, because they wanted some bishop to be approved as a saint. So this is roughly 1200. And one of the miracles that he did was that there were some beer brewers that were trying to break, brew beer, and their beer just wouldn't ferment. And he blessed it, and it fermented. But it says very clearly, they added the quake, and it wouldn't ferment. So there's no question at all what this word means. Um, this is a map of the different dialect words. The, this has to be hard to see. But the white ones in southern Norway and kind of in the regions in western Norway, that's quake. But there's many other words. Uh, the, the purple one is the one that was most common both in Norway and Sweden. In Norway, it's jester. In Sweden, jest is the same word as yeast. And uh, in the regions of Norway, that you have uh, barm. Farmhouse brewers in England call their yeast barm. Also in Orkney, they called it barm. Same word again, right? So 
We're using the same word for yeast, and it turns out we have yeasts that are related to each other. It's not a big surprise, right? Okay, let's wind this up. What's quack? It's a domesticated brewer's yeast that comes from the continent. We assume that it came from the continent in Norway, and it wasn't, didn't arise in Norway and went to the continent. It's theoretically possible, but nobody believes that. And it's a separate family. So this is, this is a really weird thing. You, you, know, you go around Western Norway and you knock on the doors, every place where they have a yeast, every single time you check it genetically, it belongs to the same family. And it's the same thing again, right? So this beer, one family that spreads across the countries. Once people had a good yeast, they took really, really good care of it. And as far as we know, quake only exists in Norway. Uh, what, what were the Swedes using? Was that quake? Nobody knows. What were the Danes using? Could have been quack, or it might have been something else. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is preaching to the choir. I'm just going to skip this. <laughs> uh, uh, farmhouse yeast, yeah? But people used to think that meant saison yeast, right? Now, saison yeast is beer too. It's a different family. But it does have similar properties, which, which I think is interesting. Um, and those are not the only two types of farmhouse yeast. I took this photo in uh, the kitchen of Sverre Skrindo in eastern Norway. He calls his yeast gong. Um, so he collects it on cloth and dries it between each use. It's actually his mum who has the job of keeping the yeast and making the yeast starter. He gets really nervous if he has to handle the yeast himself. She knows how to do it. He just knows how to brew. Now, what is this? Uh, Eastern Norway is across the mountains. It's really separated from Western Norway. People speak different dialects. A lot of the, in fact, the brewing culture was different in Eastern Norway from Western Norway. And we just uh, got hold of another one from, yeah, quite a ways further south in Eastern Norway. Going to be interesting to find out what it is. We, we don't know yet. And then, of course, there's the Baltics and Russia. This is uh, Marina Fyodorovna uh, in Chuvashia in Russia. This is like 800 kilometers east of Moscow. So she got this yeast from her mom. Uh, here she's making the, the yeast starter. She's stirring uh, in the, those two white uh, cans contain sugar and rye flour. So she's she started in, takes like two hours, then the yeast is fermenting. And I ask her, so what's your pitch temperature? What, what temperature do you put this in at? She says, I don't know. <laughs> she, she tastes the, the wort when it tastes right. Yep, that's the temperature. So I waited for her to say, now it's right. I stick the ther thermometer in, 39.1. So 0.1 degrees off Sigmund. That's what I said earlier, right? So this turns out to be something totally different. Uh, we got two yeasts from this village. They, they're not related to anything else. Uh, the Lithuanian ones are all over the map. Some are even different species. And there's one from Lithuania that turns out to be related from one, to one from Latvia. If we collect more, are we going to get a, a, a Baltic quake family? Maybe? We don't know. So the story isn't over, uh, but the talk pretty much is. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna meet the people who uh, have these yeasts, try their beer and talk to them, there's one thing that you can do. You can go to Norsk Kornel Festival in Hornido. That's like the one place. Here's uh, Tarjer of the Wolf's brother on the left with the box with Quake. To his right with the mustache is the owner of Quake number 21. They're demonstrating the local brew. You come to this festival, it's not the most exciting setting. You see it's a gym hall, but uh, <laughs> there's like the owners of eight different quakes sitting there waiting for you to come talk to them. Um, yeah, I brought these two books. The one on the left is about Lithuanian beer and you can read it because it's in English. The one on the right, you can't read because it's in Norwegian, but you can buy it anyway. <laughs> uh, and Brewer's Publications is publishing this book next year. Um, this is not a book about Quake, right? So Quake is part of chapter five. This is all the farmhouse stuff. Uh, baking in the oven, stone brewing, using juniper, all of that stuff, right? 
Should we do questions? Or you all just want to go and drink beer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Ah, yes, there are people in Norway distilling. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, distilling was, became really big in Norway, like 18th century, uh, which led to huge drinking problems, so it was forbidden. Uh, people still do it. There's like regular accounts in the newspapers of somebody's house blew up because they're still, uh, yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't know that much about it. No, I think they use bread yeast. But although I could be wrong, I, I haven't checked. That's uh, actually a good question. You at the back there? Sure. Kvaik. 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 Maybe I should do a yeast scream as well. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that. Yeah, it's the, uh, Norwegian doesn't have the W sound. So a lot of times when, when a Norwegian speaks, he will welcome you, right? He doesn't, a lot of Norwegians don't even know how to make the sound. Yeah. Uh, right, uh, the reaction they've had to what's happened has been... Uh, when, when people tell uh, uh, Sigmund that he's like a big guru in, in the US and people look up to him, he, he kind of flushes and looks embarrassed and he starts laughing and is really, really happy. Tyre uh, uh, told me like the year after my book came out, there's been too much attention to my person. <laughs> Uh, uh, one of them, when he heard that other, uh, White Labs was selling somebody else's yeast, he's like, why aren't they selling mine? I should send mine to the US. Uh, so the reactions are all over the map. The, the, people are different, right? Um, there, 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 there are a lot of people who, are, who feel uneasy about uh, people in the US making money from yeast that comes from Norway. None of the actual brewers seem to feel that way. Which is good. That makes me feel better, yeah. Right. Uh, so, yeah, you, the question is, uh, do I think the, the farmhouse brewing is going to experience a renaissance because of all the attention it's getting? Um, that was the goal. That, that, that was why I did all this. Um, because I really it was on the, on the verge of dying out. Um, I, sh I showed this photo from, uh, from all, right? Here. Uh, this village has two brewers. One, two, right? Um, if, let's say that Sverre doesn't have a son, right? He has a daughter. If she doesn't like the beer, that's one brewer. <laughs> so, in fact, Sverre, um, when his daughter was 10, he gave her half a liter of the beer and he said, if you drink all of it, you're going to get $50. <laughs> she drank it, she liked the beer, and she now knows how to brew it. Uh, which is, you know, it's heartening. Okay, so it's going to keep being two brewers. For another generation. So, uh, yeah. You know, people talk about cultural appropriation. I think when, when people in the US are using this yeast and they're showing attention to, to these brewers, you're really teaching people in Norway that this is important and that, that they should keep going. And it's, hot, it's early days, but it does look like it's, it's, uh, there is a kind of uptick in this brewing. People are certainly, they're aware now that, that they are a thing. It makes them very happy. Yeah? I think for you, it's like lager you mentioned. Is there a chance to change this to can? Do they ever use uh, lagering temps or colder temperatures? None of the traditional brewers in Norway do, but in uh, Finland. So the Finns lost their farmhouse yeast. So they buy uh, <laughs> a yeast that's called Suomen Hiva. It basically means Finnish yeast. 
That yeast is not, uh, it has lactic acid bacteria in it. So the, the people who make it say straight out, there is a certain amount of lactic acid bacteria in there. Also, this yeast is difficult to manage. I mean, Craig ferments fast, but this stuff goes totally bananas. So if, you, if you're not careful, you get weird flavors and yeah. So in, fa in, in Finland, quite a few of the brewers, they cool the wort to four degrees centigrade, or almost to freezing. Then they add the yeast and they uh, let it just rise to ambient temperature. And then the yeast wake, eventually wakes up and goes to work. So they do something kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, everybody mashes at the same temperature, right? And then you have to cool and you don't want to wait. So that's basically the, uh, the story, right? You, you, it's because you wanted to, to, to pitch early. And the thing that confuses me is Norway is not special. All of Northern Europe had the same temperatures. What's, what's weird with professional brewers? Why are you fermenting so cold? <laughs> yes, but that's kind of circular, right? Yeah. But maybe they had better control over the hygiene, and so it wasn't so dangerous to wait. I don't know. So you're saying the efficiency is poor? That might have mattered as well, yeah. I don't know. Commercial brewing is not my field. Yeah, yeah, that's actually the slide that I skipped. The, 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 this is why you have lager brewing, because you're brewing at a temperature that the lactic acid bacteria don't like. No, uh, lactic acid bacteria thrives at 35. Ah, right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, could be. It's it's a valid point. But so, uh, somebody there was first. Sigmund brews like I don't know, three four times a year. I mean, he makes 150 liters of eight and a half percent beer. He has a lot of friends. <laughs> But actually, when, when we were in Moss, we, 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 we uh, stayed over, yeah, we rented an apartment. And the guy who rented it, he, he told us that he used to brew as well. And I asked him why he stopped. So much beer. <laughs> 150 liters every time. Like, oh, he couldn't drink it. So he just gave up. Yeah. But, but it's a valid point that the evolution must have moved pretty slowly when you're brewing only twice a year. Yeah. Which has to be factored into this calculation of the centuries. Absolutely. Ah, as, yeah, so how long did, did the beer keep once they've made it? The, the, uh, all of these dots that I showed you, a lot of them come from an ethnographic survey that was done in the 1950s. One of the questions is, how long does the beer keep before it turns bad? And the answers are like all over the map. Oh, two weeks at the most, says some people. And I could keep all year. Or if you had a good seller, then it could keep four months. It's, it's very hard to get a sense of it, but... Um, what some people have told me, or one person told me, that one, you have it in a wooden cask, right? Once you start tapping it, the, the, the part of the cask that doesn't touch the beer dries out, and you get openings. So this guy had figured out that, hey, I can roll, rotate the keg a little bit every day, and it will, <laughs> it will stay closed, because once it opens up, you get the oxygen in, and stuff goes bad, right? But, so he figured out he could get halfway down, and then it wouldn't work anymore. But it's, it is very difficult to get a sense of that. Uh, my impression is that some places in Norway, if you came to visit them, they would serve you beer because they always had a little bit. Uh, but many places they didn't. It, yeah, there was only wooden casks that people kept this in. Now it's plastic and metal. I'm getting thirsty. Thanks, guys.